table, it's gonna go on. Um, my name is Ben Paulus. Uh Thank you for the introduction, thanks for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's an honor to uh, speak with you on all our time. Je vais parler en anglais aujourd'hui, mon excuse. But I'm gonna start with a bit more of a historical approach. Because when I get asked, I get asked this, you know, in many different ways by different people, by different groups, you know, how can we talk about reconciliation? How can we talk about reconciling sovereignties, how can we talk about reconciling our, our, our peoples, our histories, our paths? I think it's important to understand the different trajectories of where we're coming from. To understand what our history was, understand what the convergences are, but also understanding what the divergences are, right? And so I think in, in Quebec it's really important to note that there never really was a pursuit of any sort of formal, legal uh, agreements on land, on acquisition of land, on occupation of land, uh, you know, going back to uh, France, going back to France, uh, going back to New France. Um, and you know, this essentially means, in, in the eyes of our people, in the eyes of you know uh, international law now, you know, more and more recognized by courts, that it was settled without any sort of legal pretext. And basically, you know, in many cases, stolen uh, through a policy of, of either open war, in some cases, or benign policies of uncaring. In the end, uh, there was no real pretext to land sharing throughout a majority or you know, throughout Quebec. Uh, and then furthermore, in 1898 and again in 1912, land was further taken from the north, from what was then called Rupert's Land, by Canada, quote unquote, and granted, quote unquote, to Quebec. Uh, pretty much this was almost entirely the land of uh, Cree and Inuit people. Um, and it now, quote, now, it now makes up about two thirds of, of what is Quebec. Also unacceptable of that whole situation was that a lot of people in the, in the, who lived in that area didn't find out about that whole arrangement for up to 50 years later, which should be surprising. Um, now, looking outside of just go back, the situation doesn't get you know much better at all. Um, so the British did, of course, pursue treaties, um, but they really only started in Northern Ontario and then ended at the border with British Columbia. Uh, leaving much of Ontario, nearly all of British Columbia, all the Maritimes, and the entire Northern, uh, Northern Territories without any sort of pretense of legal occupation either. And even where these legal, these, these treaties were signed, they were based on a lot of deception and lies, right? So we, we know now that uh, they were translated well when they translated them into indigenous languages. They were never written down in indigenous languages here, they were written down in English. Um, and now we found out that uh, only recently, going through some of the, the, the treaty commissioner's journals, we found out that they were actually lying about what they were saying to the native people. So they were telling one thing to the natives about you know, how this was about land sharing, and then writing down in the English documents that this was about you know, completely giving up the land and no longer having any sort of rights to the land. And this is what was passed down you know, through British sort of legal history and textbooks and whatnot. And it's only been very recently that that's been, begun to be challenged um, and begun to be listened to, it, that, that the oral histories that are always passed down and said, no, this is what actually our people signed when they signed the treaties, means this. Uh, only, that's only now starting to be listened to. Uh, and so we have this sort of uh, completely false pretext under which the British say, oh no, look, you know, your ancestors signed this document. It says you gave up all the land and all the rights. Uh, whereas in our languages, in our, in our, you know, in our context, that's not even possible. It's not even possible to sell, to own, to give away its property, uh, land. And so that wouldn't have been really something that they could have understood uh, at the time that these, these treaties were negotiated. Now, in the rest of the country, it, it's, it's, it's a lot less than that. There's no treaties. Land was never ceded in any way. And of course, it now becomes a constant source of, source of tension. And I can tell by the amount of gray and white hair here, many people will still remember the, the, the incident at Oka, for example, a very, very real uh, example of what happens when you have those kind of tensions over who actually owns, who actually occupies, 
who actually controls, who actually has any sort of say over the land. So you have these days, uh, let's kind of force the government to, to put a little bit more pressure off pursuing what they call modern treaties. Uh, you know, the, the James Bay Agreement was one of those. Sorry to a brother here that it didn't uh, apparently go as well for everybody that was involved. There have been other ones in British Columbia, uh, but not a whole lot uh, over, over the past, you know, 30 or 40 years uh, that this has become somewhat of an issue in, in the courts. But this is, of course, still a big deal for a lot of First Nations. A lot of First Nations never, you know, pretty much every First Nation says that they are still responsible for those lands, those waters, the animals, everything that's, that exists in their traditional territories. And this is, this is really where that position of sovereignty comes from. It's from saying, we've never given this up. This has never been taken away from us. There's no reason that anybody should be able to come and say to us, oh, no, no, sorry, this isn't your land anymore. We're actually going to put you know, a mine here. We're going to cut down all these trees. We're going to flood this area. We're putting it down. However, of course, this, this, this has never been a position of any of the mainstream political parties, really, nor uh, government, nor courtrooms, nor most of the general public. But that's slowly starting to change. Uh, I think one of the biggest shifts was one mentioned by Andrew already, the Chilcotin case coming out of British Columbia recently, um, where the Supreme Court basically ruled that because this first nation in British Columbia had never ceded any of their rights, they still have what is called title to land, and basically still have all of the inherent rights to that land. And what that means is still largely undefined. But it does mean that the courts are starting to recognize that First Nations didn't give away their rights in a lot of, a lot of even legal senses. And for that community in particular, it means that they would actually have potentially a right to block a development, block developments in their territory, which is a huge sort of thing and, and actually feeds into uh, the recently passed UN, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, specifically the provision on free, prior, informed consent. And so this is what a lot of First Nations are fighting for. It's, it's that right to say yes, but also the right to say no uh, to any of these sort of things that, that sort of creep into their territory. And so this, this is huge. This is a huge ruling that could have profound implications for a lot of other First Nations all across the entire country. Uh, because it essentially affects any sort of resource development, potentially even legal policy that the government wants to imply uh, or impose on those lands. So covering everything from mining, forestry, dams, oil, gas, fracking, even pipelines, roads, or electrical lines. These have all been projects that have been imposed on First Nations communities historically and up until now, and all projects that have devastated First Nations and caused numerous conflicts. So we have to understand, of course, that you know, much of the basis of modern Canada uh, is a legal, moral, historical fallacy that's been conveniently ignored everywhere, from classrooms to courtrooms to boardrooms. Um, and I think that that's, that's it's, it's a really crucial piece to sort of understand where Native movements are coming from. Um, in many cases, really only starting as recently as the 1960s, um, when the Trudeau government, the previous Trudeau government, uh, tried to impose the, what's called the white paper under the, the the leadership of uh, Indian Affairs Minister John Kachin, and basically, you know, wipe away a lot of Native rights. And that was the first time, really, in an international way, that Native groups started to get mobilized, started to get involved uh, in politics. Uh, it's also, I think, probably surprising to a lot of people to maybe know that up until I think it was the 1950s or maybe 1960, it was actually illegal for Native people to hire lawyers. Uh, they were not allowed to have any legal representation at all because the government felt that they would lose quite rightly, uh, a lot of cases or that they would be, wouldn't be able to negotiate away a lot of these land cessation deals, leases to businesses, that kind of thing. So I want to touch a little bit on, on, on what my understanding is of Quebec sovereignty movement as it, as it relates to this history. Uh, this is, of course, probably the subject I'm, I'm less familiar with. Uh, in 1995, I was uh, just in grade school. Um, but I remember it was, it was a very big thing. My dad was working with a lot of First Nations communities and you know, it, was a, it, was a, it was a big thing for a lot of Native people as well. Um, how many people have, have seen or read uh, the document Sovereign and Justice? Nobody? Sovereign, Sovereign and Justice? 
It was a document produced by the Grand Council of Decrees at the time. And it was, a, it was a very, very sort of exhaustive, extensive legal uh, review of uh, Quebec sovereignty and, and, and Quebec independence as it pertained to native rights and native issues. And what it looked like, and it not just it didn't just look at the creeds, but also how it would in fact impact other you know, First Nations communities across uh, Quebec. So essentially their position was one of defending the right to self-determination, the right to define whether you know, the creed or any other First Nation uh, would be involved or not with you know Quebec's independence, but it also brought up a lot of I think really crucial conflicting uh, claims, principally over land, uh, especially because of the time. Uh, of course, many separatists claimed that they would simply take control over the entire you know land mass that was considered Quebec. Uh, many First Nations thought that this would be you know illegal or at least against their interests. And the sort of implication was that you know Quebec would be probably prepared to send in you know the police or troops or whatever to enforce uh, this rule of law into these First Nations communities. Um, and this really brought out a lot of the worst uh, parts of you know different aspects of Quebec society with different uh, leaders uh, from the different parties saying that you know First Nations had no right to self determination at all which was a huge slap in the face, of course, to a lot of people at the time. And again, 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 this, this is in the context of, you know, a lot of First Nations only finding out that they were part of Quebec in the 1960s. Um, and also in the 1970s, there was a riots uh, in Inuit communities that were basically squashed by the Quebec police over language laws that were being introduced and imposed on their communities. Again, sort of out of the blue for them. So this really sent a lot of the message to a lot of Native uh, communities, a lot of Native organizations and movements that, you know, this, this Quebec sovereignty cause would just be the same emperor wearing different clothes, a new kind of colonialism imposed on them from, from up high, from thousands of kilometers away that they would have to listen to. Um, because, you know, I think the question on a lot of their minds was what would have changed fundamentally? Was there, you know, really a desire to improve things on the vast majority, of, on the part of the vast majority of Quebec law? Would it have changed the relationship fundamentally? Would it have ended resource colonialism in any way? And the answer to a lot of these questions was that it seemed fairly unlikely from where you know the, the sovereignty movement was at at that point, at least the majority of it. And so I think that that left a really bad taste in a lot of Native groups' mouths um, that you know really continues to this day. Uh, because especially you had a lot of more conservative elements, you know, basically saying openly racist things. Uh, again, this was also just after Oka, which had opened up, I think, a huge sort of racial and, and, and political divide uh, in Quebec as well. Uh, and in the end, the polls that came back from Native communities showed that Native people were up between 95 and 99 percent voting against uh, Quebec sovereignty. Uh, you know, the farther north you went, the higher, with you know non-participation virtually in a lot of Mohawk communities. So, you know, if you fast forward 20 years um, to last year's provincial elections, and what I think was significant was that, again, you know, the, the sort of discussions around sovereignty, uh, again, became a sort of prominent theme with, again, native issues generally ignored. And so I, I saw an interview with uh, Ghislaine Picard, uh, who's the, the Grand Chief of uh, FN for Quebec and Labrador, as well as other chiefs from different uh, Mohawk communities who basically said that you know they didn't receive any sort of communication at all uh, from any of the major parties uh, during that entire election period, in particular over you know some of the concerns they had around you know uh, separation and sovereignty and whatnot, which I think is significant, not just because they're political parties. Uh, you know I think we do have to have a lot of pressure and a lot of, 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 of you know always. Uh, keeping the pressure on political parties, but I think it's still really, um, really significant that you know after 20 years, there wasn't enough of a general sense in Quebec that hey, this can't be done, this can't be imposed on you know First Nations here, without having some sort of conversation, without having you know bringing in and involving First Nations in the first place. Um, so I think, and then in reading that and hearing that. One of the things that it reminded me of was some of the stuff that's actually going on right now in the United States, 
uh, with the Black Lives Matter uh, movement uh, happening simultaneously with the United States presidential election. So of course you have a lot of different candidates running for the President of the United States. Uh, everyone from the bad shit insane of Donald Trump uh, to slightly more reasonable candidates to Hillary Clinton to surprisingly progressive candidates like Bernie Sanders being included uh, in sort of mainstream conversations. And so a few weeks ago, members of the, the Black Lives Matter uh, movement interrupted Bernie Sanders, again, consider, widely considered the most progressive candidate running, self-identifying as a socialist, uh, running for the leadership of uh, the Democrats. Uh, and they, so they interrupted the speech that he was doing, and it didn't seem as big of an issue uh, at the moment. They simply, they simply asked for a moment of silence and to say a few words. But what happened afterwards, I think, was the most sort of telling aspect of this. It was the reaction of his supporters, not, so not the candidate himself, but his supporters, um, where we saw many of them boo the woman uh, who were on stage, they hurled insults, and then it really continued online with the mixture of sexist and racist uh, comments, including uh, stuff online afterwards, blogs, uh, analysis by you know, major uh, media. And so I, I thought a lot about that incident and you know what's what's sort of come out of it. And there's been a lot of discussions that have that have actually emerged out of it. Um, members of his uh, campaign team have met with other leaders of the movement, and I think that that's you know having some sort of positive effect. But I think it, it shows that there's a large way to go with you know a lot of the basis of the movements, and I think that you know it really presents a similar situation to what we're seeing uh, in Canada, in Quebec, uh, really everywhere. Because I think a lot of us would like to believe that there's a lot of people in the movement who just sort of get it, who understand these principles, who, who, who share these same sort of values. But I think there's still a lot of harder truths out there um, that we haven't quite reconciled. There's a lot of difficult conversations we need to have. Which I think, you know, tonight is, is a great example on this whole, uh, you know, 40 experience I think is useful for that. Because, you know, we can't simply allow our movements to be content with not being Donald Trump not being the least worst alternative out there. We have to want to do more. And that sometimes requires you know, clarifying and pushing members of our own base to see and make sure that you know, they're actually on the same side of us or they're actually on the same side of the allies we want to allow, align ourselves with. Which means that we, uh, if we, like the, the Black Lives Matter movement in the, in the United States, want to mobilize these bases, we have to be spreading that message and making it a central point of discussion, of conversation, and of agitation with those folks that we're interacting with, that we're pushing. And so that, you know, really, really, I think, reflects on movements in Quebec to be educating your own people, you know, white folks, Quebecois, other people who don't, you don't know, already necessarily identify with your movements, with political parties, with whatever uh, is going on here. Because it shouldn't be acceptable that, you know, in the, main, the mainstream political parties would still be skirting Aboriginal issues here, uh, or in, you know, the federal election, uh, you know, in 2015. And to, to refine that point a little bit even further, I also think, um, like the Black Lives Matter movement is doing in the United States, we're coming face to face with, where they're coming face to face with being the most progressive pre presidential candidate they've ever seen in a while, there's still an expectation by his supporters, by folks in, in who are, you know, forming behind him like a movement, uh, in, any way, in many ways similar to, you know, the kind of movement that seemed to emerge around Barack Obama, there's still an expectation that, you know, by, by these supporters of, of this progressive candidate, that the Black Lives Matter folks will eventually rally around them in the end and say, okay, you know, we're on your side, well, let's all work together. Um, that eventually these Black Lives Matter groups will eventually compromise and say, yes, you're the best way to achieve what we want, and we'll support you, we'll march with you, we'll join you. But it's rarely ever been posed as the other way that the political party would ask, you know, how can we support you? How can we get behind you? And so it's really, it's really more seen by, you know, movement folks in, you know, Black Lives Matter or Native folks here that, you know, political parties and other groups are sometimes asking, what is the minimum that you need for you to support us? And I think that that's, it's, it's a kind of expression that I've heard, you know, echoed in many, many cases by, you know, everything from solidarity groups to political parties 
uh, to, of course, do businesses and corporations trying to, you know, <coughs> put in a mind on the community saying, you know, what is the minimum that we need to do to get you guys on, on behind us? Um, but, you know, the question that, that, that movements and other groups that want to be aligned should really be asking is, you know, what are your priorities and how can we be aligned? How can we support you? Because I don't necessarily think that any movements uh, and Quebec sovereignty movements are opposed or incompatible. But I also don't think that they necessarily have the same goal. And that, you know, many, many people within those movements don't necessarily realize it or we just assume otherwise. We just assume that, you know, they are aligned and they have the same goals at the end of the day. And so I do think there are a lot of areas that progressives, you know, here who are focused on sovereignty uh, could support native movements. And I think that there's a large space of convergence in the places that there might be a lot of agreement on. And there's a great need to support a lot of Native communities and Native groups on a, lot of, on a wide variety of issues. And, I, and I'm not going to attempt to be exhausted on trying to name them all, but the ones that you know, come to mind immediately are, for example, uh, the issue of missing and murdered Indigenous women, for example, uh, just as relevant in, in Quebec as everywhere else across the country. Uh, issues of education, uh, you know, the fact that children on, on First Nations Reserve receive less money than any other children in the country or the fact that our languages are not being taught in many of our schools. Uh, the issues of healthcare, the fact that you know, many of our communities, uh, there's almost no access to healthcare, to hospitals. Uh, sometimes people have to put on waiting lists for you know, ambulances or whatever to be uh, taken out of their communities. Or the lack of healthy food and clean water in our communities. The lack of housing. Uh, the ongoing struggles across the country to protect and preserve our land and waters from things like mining, oil, and pipelines. Um, you know, most recently we saw in, in uh, New Brunswick, the community of Las uh, resisting a huge industrial gas fracking operation beneath their territory, where a lot of people were eventually arrested and went to jail for that. Or we saw in the documentary, a lot of First Nations uh, in Alberta have been spending years trying to stop uh, the tar sands, the biggest industrial uh, oil operation in the world, uh, going on in their backyard and now spreading across the country via pipelines. Or there's a number of issues dealing with you know, police injustice. Um, that there's you know, still an incredible amount of racism against Aboriginal people. Um, there's still an incredible over-representation of Aboriginal people in justice and court system, the Aboriginal women in particular. In the US, I, mean, I just read recently that they actually ran through all the statistics and found out that more Native uh, people are being killed by police than by any other group. Uh, which was surprising, uh, but also probably likely a similar situation was happening in Canada, except that we don't actually collect that kind of data here. Um, and you know, we, we heard as recently as a month ago there was a Native woman who actually died uh, while in jail in Alberta. And again, this was widely reported, widely un, you know recognized outside of Native communities. So what we're seeing is that we have you know fundamentally a lot of these issues pushed by central government that is focused on cutting these services and as well as taxes for the rich while pushing the charges, pushing criminalization onto our poor, the First Nations, other people of color, and silencing and shutting down anyone who's getting in their way. Um, and I think these are these are a lot of issues that, you know, there would be a lot of similarity, there would be a lot of common cause with progressive movements uh, between both camps. And I think that that's probably the most necessary and important work right now, looking at the fact that a lot of Native people aren't really out there, you know, searching for what progressive movements exist in Quebec uh, and what they might be doing for them. I think that the, the, the proof really has to be out there in action. Maybe people want to see a lot of this, this, this action really taking place, a lot of people actually speaking out about these issues that aren't from their own communities. Because at the end of the day, I think any mature and progressive sovereignist movement would have to be one that, of course, respected First Nations rights, uh, rights to self-determination and the rights to free and prior informed consent, meaning that communities or nations uh, would have to choose how they relate with the movement or not, as would likely be the case with a number of Mohawk communities, for example. <laughs> and I think that means really thinking through how to accept uh, responsibility as well um, on behalf of the historical, moral, and even legal baggage that is represented by the idea of sovereign groups in Quebec, but also, crucially, uh, 
represented by being a central government, uh, the government of Quebec itself, and, other, and a representative of even the federal government in many regards. I think there, there's a lot of relationship building that you know, still has to be done, and a lot of distrust and non-understanding non on both sides. A lot of work needs to be done to get mainstream Quebec society, though, to the level where a lot of us think that we would like to be at. And at the same time, a lot of common cause needs to be done in working on dealing with those issues that are urgent today and acting in solidarity with those communities that are in struggle. And as my brother said, you know, this kind of reconciliation is possible, I think, but it only can be done and get there through a lot of hard work and reflection. Thank you. Now.